Welcome to another edition of Return to the Word Radio with Bible teacher Mark Fontecchio. Advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now with today's message, here is our teacher. As we open Daniel chapter 9, the prophetic significance of this chapter cannot be overstated. If you do not understand the prophecy of the 70 weeks towards the end of the chapter, I don't think you can fully come to terms with God's plan for the ages. The Bible reveals to us at least four major programs of God. God has a plan for the angels. God has a plan for the Gentiles, Israel, and the church. Daniel 9 highlights the plan of God for both the Gentiles and the nation of Israel. And that distinction is one of the keys that unlocks Bible prophecy. But here's the thing, before we get there, there's a great Old Testament display of a man of God in prayer. A three-year-old boy went to the grocery store with his mother. Before they entered the grocery store, she said to him, now you're not gonna get any chocolate chip cookies, so don't even ask. She put him in the cart, and he sat in a little seat while she wheeled the cart down the aisles. He was doing good. He was doing just fine until they came to the cookie section. He saw the chocolate chip cookies and he stood up in the seat and said, Mom, can I have some chocolate chip cookies? She warned him, I told you not even to ask. You're not getting any cookies. He sat back down, feeling defeated. They went down the aisles, but as they searched for something in the store they couldn't find, you've been there, they ended up back in the cookie aisle. Mom, can I please have some chocolate chip cookies? (laughs) Again, she told him, I told you that you can't have any. Now sit down and be quiet. Well, finally, they approached the checkout lane. The little boy sensed that this was his last chance. So before they got to the line, he stood up on the seat of the cart and shouted in his loudest voice that he could, in the name of Jesus, may I have some chocolate chip cookies. I love it. Everyone in the checkout lines busted out in laughter. Some applauded. And then, because of the generosity of the other people shopping, the little boy and his mother left with 23 boxes of chocolate chip cookies. True story. But I hope this isn't your understanding of prayer. There are lessons here in Daniel 9 that we can apply to our prayer lives. This is a rich text. Daniel 9, we start with verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who is made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications, with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face, as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Think of the time frame of this text. Verse 1 sets the stage in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. To better understand the timing, turn back, if you would, to the end of chapter 5. Chapter 5 is the famous text where King Belshazzar had the feast with the Medo Persians camped outside the city. The handwriting appeared on the wall. And then notice verse 31 in chapter 5. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. 
Back when we first studied this together, I made mention that history mentions no man by the name of Darius the Mede. I believe he was a man that was appointed to rule over this newly conquered territory. Cyrus was the king over Medo Persia, and Darius was probably appointed by Cyrus to rule over the old Babylonian Empire. Now, part of the reason I believe this is because of verse 1 back in chapter 9. Darius was, notice the wording back in chapter 9, Darius was of the lineage of the Medes. Cyrus, the leader of the Medo Persian Empire, was Persian. So this wasn't him. Cyrus was not of the Medes. Look again at the rest of verse 1 in Daniel 9. Darius was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Darius was put in charge over the old Babylonian empire. So just keep it straight in your mind. Cyrus over all of Medo Persia. Darius over part of it. Darius over the old Babylonian empire. So Daniel chapter 9 is taking place roughly between 539 to 538 B.C. Daniel had been in Babylon for over 65 years. Daniel was around 80 years old. The city of Jerusalem had been in ruins for almost 50 years. And the timing of chapter 9, it grabs you if you connect the dots. Listen, this happens around the same time as that of chapter 6, when Daniel was at the height of his career serving under Darius. And in Daniel chapter 6, what was it that Daniel got in trouble for? What was it that caused Daniel to get thrown into the lion's den? Prayer. He was in the upper room praying towards Jerusalem. In the scene of chapter 9 is a record of one of those times when Daniel was in prayer to the Lord. Babylon had been taken over. Now that the Medo Persians were in charge, there was a real possibility that the Hebrew people could finally return home. Verse 2 is significant. Take a look. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. This is one of the most significant verses in the book of Daniel. Recognize what is taking place. Daniel had been studying the word of God. He'd been studying the book of Jeremiah, and he called it his words, the word of the Lord. Daniel believed that the book of Jeremiah is the word of God. Jeremiah had only died just a few decades before, but notice the wording. Daniel said he understood by the books, books plural. Here's what this means. It refers to a sacred collection of books. And the Hebrew people had set aside some of the Old Testament books and considered them sacred as the word of the Lord. This alone testifies of the remarkable preservation of God's word. The Hebrew people were in captivity in a foreign land. Babylon had come and gone, and yet the word of the Lord remained. Jeremiah himself had been taken captive by some of the Jews who rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. They carried him off to Egypt against his will. Jeremiah had died there, but the scriptures found their way across the desert from Egypt into the hands of Daniel in Babylon. At the end of verse 2, Daniel was reading about the 70 years of captivity. Remarkable. Daniel himself had been in captivity for 66 or 67 years at this point. So Daniel turned to the word of God to study about these 70 years that were predicted through the prophet Jeremiah. Now there is actually two passages in the book of Jeremiah that Daniel could have been reading. Let's turn to the first one. Our first stop is Jeremiah chapter 29. And once you get there, we'll pick it up with verse 10. Jeremiah 29, verse 10, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. 
It's possible that this was the text that Daniel was reading, but I have some doubt it was only this text. Here's the reason. Daniel chapter 9, verse 2 talks about the desolations of Jerusalem. This text actually emphasizes the restoration. So turn over to Jeremiah chapter 25, starting with verse 11. This is the passage that I really think that Daniel was reading. Jeremiah 25, and we'll start with verse 11. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So I'll bring on that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah has prophesied concerning all the nations. Both Jeremiah 25 and Jeremiah 29 are predictions that the people would be in captivity for 70 years. But this is the text that I believe Daniel was studying almost 2,600 years ago. It's an amazing text. In verse 9, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was even named by name years ahead of time. The false prophets of Jeremiah's day laughed at him and lied to the people. Keep in mind the power and strength that the Medo Persian Empire had. That was in place as Daniel was studying this passage. They had conquered Babylon, and that was pretty much considered impossible in that day. So just from a human point of view, the idea of the nation of Israel returning to the land, it had to seem pretty bleak. But God had promised. God keeps his word. Count on it. Daniel did. The remnant of Israel did, as should we. This was the promise of the living God, a God who cannot lie. Because based on this prediction in Jeremiah, Daniel knew they would be in Babylon for 70 years, and I have no problem believing that Daniel could do the math. 66 or 67 years had gone by. It had been almost 70 years that Israel had been captive. The end had to be coming. Daniel believed in the word of God. Now, before we can head back to Daniel, we have to wrestle with a couple of issues. First, why 70 years? And I think the answer is found over in 2 Chronicles. Let's head there. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Here we have the historical record of when Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem. Let's pick it up partway through. 2 Chronicles 36, and we'll start with verse 19. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons, until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. If you go on to read verses 22 through 23, you see the record where Cyrus of Persia gave the command to let the Hebrew people go back to their land and rebuild the temple of God at Jerusalem. But focus in on verse 21. The 70 years in captivity was to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. Jot down Leviticus 25, because Leviticus 25 teaches that every seventh year the land was not to be planted. It was to rest. Idol worship and open rebellion against God got the tribes of Israel in the situation they were in. But the 70 years, this was the time of their captivity, because included in their list of sins and all of their rejection of God's plan for them, they didn't let the land rest every seventh year. And apparently, this added up to about 70 years where the land should have rested. Listen to Leviticus 26, which lists out what would happen if the people did not obey the Lord. I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest for the time it did not rest on your Sabbaths when you dwelt in it. 
God commanded for the land to receive its rest. God did what the people would not do. The other question that comes in was when did the 70 years begin? Daniel and some of the young men had first been taken captive in 605 B.C. A second group was taken captive in 597, and the third group was not until 586 B.C. And so when do you start counting those 70 years from 605, 597, or 586 B.C.? Follow me closely on this. God communicated to man in a manner that we can understand. And there are times in the Word of God where the record of the events, it uses approximate numbers. Let me give you an example. In Exodus 12, it says the captivity in Egypt was 430 years. In Acts 7, Stephen said it was 400 years. He gave an approximate number. We do this all the time in our everyday speech, and there are times in the Word of God where we see this. The 70 years of captivity in Jeremiah 25, this is one of those times. It was an approximate number. But still, when did it start? We know from Ezra 1 that the temple foundation was started again in 536 B.C. as the Hebrews made their way back into the land. Simple math means that about 70 years earlier was 605 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar first came against Jerusalem. But then again, the temple was destroyed in 586 B.C., and the temple was actually rebuilt in 515 B.C. Foundation was started in 536, actually rebuilt in 515, which also is about 70 years for the temple. Israel was captive for about 70 years, and the temple of God was desolate for about 70 years. Which one was meant in verse 2 of Daniel 9? Good arguments on both sides. Both Jeremiah 25 and Jeremiah 29 are predictions that the people would be in captivity for 70 years. And so I tend to think that this is what Daniel was focused on, the captivity of his people. Make your way back to Daniel and think of the words of Jeremiah 29, verse 10, that had to be echoing through Daniel's head. After 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and cause you to return to this place. I am one that tends to think that Daniel knew of the prophecies given to Isaiah. Isaiah 44, 28, predicted of Cyrus the Persian, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built into the temple, your foundation shall be laid. And again, Isaiah 45, 13, referring again to Cyrus, he shall build my city and let my exiles go free, not for price nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. Remember, when Isaiah wrote this, Babylon was not a world empire. Persia wasn't even on the horizon. Both the city of Jerusalem and the temple were thriving. Apart from the prophetic word of God in Isaiah's day, there was absolutely nothing that indicated Jerusalem would be destroyed and God's people would be taken to Babylon. But for Daniel, he lived in the day when Cyrus had fulfilled the words of Isaiah. Cyrus had the world in his grasp. The Babylonian Empire had been taken over by Cyrus of Persia, and it meant that soon the Hebrew people would be going home. It had to be an exciting time for the Hebrew people of faith, those that trusted the promises of God. Verse 3 in Daniel. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Maybe you heard the old story of a small Oklahoma town that had two churches and one brewery. Members of both churches complained that the brewery was giving the community a bad image. To make matters worse, the owner of the brewery was an outspoken atheist. He didn't believe in God at all. The church people had tried unsuccessfully for years to shut down the brewery. So finally, they decided to hold a joint Saturday night prayer meeting. They were going to ask God to intervene and settle the matter. The church people gathered on Saturday night, and there was a horrible thunderstorm coming through the area. To the delight of the church members, lightning hit the old brewery, and it burned to the ground. The next morning, the sermon in both churches was on the power of prayer but the insurance adjusters promptly notified the owner of the brewery that they were not going to pay for the damages because the fire was an act of God. And that 
was an exclusion in the policy. As you can imagine, the owner of the brewery was furious, and he sued both churches, claiming that they had conspired with God to destroy his business. But the churches denied that they had anything to do with the cause of the fire. The presiding judge opened the trial with these words. I find one thing in this case most perplexing. We have a situation here where the plaintiff, an atheist, is professing his belief in the power of prayer. And the defendants, all faithful church members, are denying the very same power. Looking at the life of Daniel, we see the record of a man that lived it. He believed in the power of prayer. Daniel had questions. Daniel was concerned about his people. The Hebrew people had settled into Babylon. A generation had come and gone. For some, Babylon was the only home they knew. Daniel desperately wanted his people to return home to their land. He wasn't responsible for their stubborn hearts. He wasn't responsible for their open rebellion against God, but he identified himself with them. And his plan of action, his response was to pray. Based on the remarkable prophecies found in Jeremiah, Daniel prayed for the restoration of Jerusalem and the regathering of the people of Israel. Think of the lesson. Prayer is the answer. Our understanding of prophecy should lead us to humble hearts before God. And as we seek him, pray according to the promises he's written down for us. According to his own report in verse 3, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I set my face toward the Lord God. We already saw in chapter 6 that Daniel faced Jerusalem when he prayed, but the idea of the wording is that Daniel set his face towards God. Daniel recognized the authority of God in his life. He interceded for the nation, for his people. He sought mercy from God, and the focus in this verse is very much on the attitude of Daniel, his humility before the Lord. He prepared himself by fasting, and he followed the tradition of the day of dressing in sackcloth, sprinkling ashes on his head as a way to show outwardly the repentant heart of a man on behalf of his people. He was focused on communicating with God, not the comforts of this world. Here comes the prayer, starting in verse 4. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Daniel tells us here, And I prayed to Yahweh my God. Daniel fasted. Daniel mourned. His heart was filled with humility because he knew that the people of Israel deserved the chastening of the Lord, not mercy, not compassion. But Daniel also knew that despite all of the disobedience to God by the Hebrew people, God had promised mercy. God had promised to deliver his people. Their cities had been taken captive from them, their homes, their land, their freedom. And they had no ground to stand on before a holy God other than his mercy, his grace. The people had sinned, committed iniquity. They rebelled against the very precepts of God. And I think what we have in Daniel is his honest desire for God to restore his people, for them to become a living testimony to the grace of God because the Hebrew God is faithful to his word. Daniel prayed with faith that God would show mercy to those that walked with him. The Hebrew people didn't listen to God, and they didn't listen to his prophets either. Verse 6, Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers, and all the people of the land. The people didn't listen. As the prophets of God spoke to the kings and princes, the Hebrew people stood condemned, guilty before a righteous God, and when warned by the prophets, when warned by men like Isaiah and Jeremiah, The people would not turn back. Judah did for a time, but it didn't last. But God, in his infinite love, just kept sending messenger after messenger, calling his people back to him. This leads us to our last two verses. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face as it is to this day. 
to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off and all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belong shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Daniel is contrasting here the righteousness of God with Israel's shame. He's saying God is not to be blamed for the sins of his people. Righteousness belongs to God. Shame of face to the Hebrew people. Shame of face. It means the shame felt in the heart of someone who stands guilty. It can be seen on their face. Like a little kid that stands guilty, their face betrays them. So it was for the people of Judah and Israel. Generation after generation disobeyed the Lord. Their situation, brought about by their own sin, was shameful. And so it is for every person in open disobedience to God. Every type of person from Judah stood guilty. The men of Judah, those of Jerusalem, all of Israel, the remnant left in the land, those hauled off to Babylon, and the northern tribes, which had been taken captive by Assyria, No matter where the Hebrew people were scattered, some had fled to Egypt. No matter where the Lord had driven them, because of their guilt before God, they stood in shame, including the kings, the princes, and their fathers. King Jehoiakim had been taken captive in 597 B.C. 2 Kings 25 teaches us he was kept in prison for 37 years. Zedekiah was ruling in 586 B.C. He witnessed the death of his sons and then was taken captive. Heed the warnings given to Israel. Heed the lesson. God keeps his word. He chastens those whom he loves, and those that reject him stand condemned. Every time I read the following story, I think that this is just one of these stories that is too hard to believe. And every time I look it up, I find more and more documentation showing us that this actually happened. The year was 1820, and Peter Richley was a grateful man. He had survived one of the strangest and most terrifying events known to man. The ship he had been traveling on sank. He was rescued. But the ship he was rescued by also sank. Keeping in mind, this was 1820. Wooden ships sank more often, but not this often because he was rescued again, but this third ship also sank. Picked up again, and the fourth ship sank. Soon after he got on board, the fifth ship also sank. I'm thinking the lesson at this point is this is not a man you would want on your ship. Boats tend to sink when he's around. After this fifth boat sank, he floated with confidence, because it is said he began to realize that somehow, some way, God did not want him to die. And sure enough, almost on cue, another ship came by and rescued him. This time the boat was an ocean liner, the city of Leeds it was named. It was bound from England to Australia and was traveling in the same sea lane as all the other ships that Peter had been on that had sunk. The crew of the ocean liner pulled him aboard. They gave him dry clothes. The doctor on board gave him a quick exam, found him to be perfectly fine, and then he asked for an unusual request. He told Peter, there's a lady on board who booked passage to Australia. She's looking for her son who disappeared years ago. She's dying. She's asking to see her son. She knows everyone on board, and since you are the only person she does not know on board, could you pretend to be her son? Not the most honest path, but that is what they did, and Peter agreed. He followed the doctor below deck and entered the cabin. There, on a small bed, was a frail woman. She had a high fever. She was delirious, and there she was, crying out to God, Please, God, let me see my son before I die. I must see my son. The ship's doctor nudged him forward toward the bed. But instead of pretending, Peter richly began to cry because lying there on that bed was the reason God had spared his life five times. Here was the lifeline that kept him from drowning. Lying on that bed was Sarah Richley, who had been praying for 10 years to be reconciled to her son, Peter. The ship's doctor stood in amazement as the young man fell down by the bed and embraced his mother. After just a few days, her fever left her 
and his mother awoke to find an answered prayer seated on the edge of her bed. Do you believe in the power of prayer? Daniel did, and sometimes God's answer just may surprise you. He won't always say yes, but James put it this way, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Pray with purpose. Pray with love for the Lord, for His people. Pray in harmony with His Word. Pray often. Let it be your first course of action, not your last. Pray with humility, confessing your sins to the Lord. And pray with trust that you have direct access to the throne of grace, to the loving God who cares for you. If you find this broadcast helpful to your faith, please remember that we are listener supported. We don't spend a lot of time asking for money, but we do depend on your prayers and support to cover our costs. Even smaller monthly donations help us to tell others of God's amazing grace. You can find out more on returntotheword.com. Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, P.O. Box 879259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening, and we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.